In 1936, a prototype heavy bomber was in the middle of a complex and problem riddled development, but it held great promise. It had smooth, modern lines, it was driven by four powerful engines, it had a numerous crew, it was bristling with defensive guns that were set in modern, powered turrets, and its manufacturer had built it on principles learned from the development of large domestic aircraft. If this summary makes you think of the Boeing 299, the ill-fated precursor to the famous B-17 Flying Fortress, I wouldn't blame you, but I was instead referring to another four-engine heavy bomber, one that was being developed in the Soviet Union, a bomber that would eventually be known as the Petlyakov PE-8. Its story begins in 1931, when the Soviet Air Force, or VVS, was contemplating the idea of a new heavy bomber to replace the Tupolev TB-3. Now, this was a somewhat far-reaching exercise in contemplation, as the TB-3 had yet to even enter frontline service. But with aviation technology advancing with every year, it was accepted that the TB-3 could become obsolete rather quickly. Because of this, the VVS penned a tentative specification for a replacement bomber, and approached the various design bureaus of the Soviet aircraft industry to see what they could do. Initially, they wanted a bomber that could carry a 10-ton bomb load over a 2,000km range, cruising at 250km an hour and at an altitude of 7,000 metres. In essence, it was a huge upgrade over the TB-3 in terms of overall bomb load, but only a slight upgrade when you look at speed, range and service ceiling. It also made no considerations for things such as enclosed cockpits to deal with the higher altitude, nor did it allow much in the way of equipment or defensive armament. Unsurprisingly, over the next two years, and after collaborating with various aircraft designers, Tupolev in particular, and after a keener appreciation of just how fast fighter aircraft were becoming, and how outdated their requirements were, the specification for the heavy bomber was gradually revised. On the 29th of July 1934, Andrei Tupolev officially began working on a new bomber design to meet the somewhat nebulous requirements of the VVS. He proposed a four-engine cantilever monoplane with a smooth, stressed skin, as opposed to the corrugated skin of his earlier designs. He offered three variants of this new design, a heavy bomber, an escort gunship with enough defensive guns to even make the Americans envious, and an unarmed troop transport. Tupolev's submission was good enough to warrant official interest, and in December of that year, funding was released for the development of a prototype. Along with this came a revised specification to which the bomber was to be built, which, unlike the original, actually took into account the rapid progress being made in aircraft development. The bomber was now to carry a two-ton bomb load across a range of 4,500 kilometers, at speeds of up to 440 kilometers an hour, and at an altitude of no less than 10,000 meters. Because of the high speed and altitude performance, the requirement for the escort version of the aircraft was dropped, though there remained a lingering demand for a transport version, but in the end this was never to be built. Work on the bomber did not begin proper until 1935. This was due to some rearrangements that were being made in the Soviet aircraft industry, partly to help improve its collaborative effectiveness, and partly because the NKVD were organising so-called factory prisons for designers who had lost Stalin's favour. Following this period of rearrangement, a special design bureau was formed that was to manage the development of the new heavy bomber from start to finish. Tupolev and his team would manage the project from an administrative perspective, along with several others, and to dictate its overall direction. But a team led by Vladimir Petlyakov would handle the actual design and construction of the prototype and subsequent production models. To add to this slightly confusing arrangement, the internal designation of the aircraft would be known as the ANT-42, which would suggest that the whole thing was designed by Tupolev, when in fact Petlyakov did most of the major design work. That being said, the design of the bomber inherited much from an earlier Tupolev design, the ANT-40, 
or more commonly known as the Tupolev SB, perhaps the Bureau's most successful design, and one that will definitely get its own video in the future. The aerodynamics and stressing of the prototype airframe closely resembled that of the SB, albeit scaled up by a factor of two. And like the SB, much of the airframe material was made up from D16 grade duraluminium. One of the few exceptions was within the wings. Due to the size of the aircraft, with a projected wingspan to exceed 38 meters, a heavier but high strength steel was used for the two main spars. The other exception was the four main longerons of the complex fuselage, which were also made of this same steel, but the rest of the complex framework was made from duraluminium. In terms of technology, the ANT-42 was a huge leap forward over the old TB-3. The latest types of electrical, radio and navigational equipment were provided to enable the bomber to operate by night, or in bad weather, and a large number of electrical drives were used in the aircraft's various systems. The aircraft was also far more streamlined, something which was absolutely necessary if it were to achieve the required top speeds. It would carry almost all of its bombs internally, the various crew stations were all enclosed, and the defensive guns were installed in much more sensible positions, as opposed to the somewhat terrifying dustbin turrets that were found on the TB-3. The desire for the most streamlined airframe possible was probably the main cause for the prototype's strange fuselage cross-section. As it was more pear-shaped than spherical, the two pilots had to be seated in a pair of narrow tandem cockpits, rather than the side-by-side -side arrangement that was more common for bombers of this class. These cockpits were also set quite far back, which meant that the pilots would have to sometimes rely on the crew members in the nose for instructions when the bomber was taxiing around on the ground. As initially planned, the bomber had a large crew of 9 or 10, Two pilots, a navigator and bomb aimer, a radio operator, an engineer, and the rest were gunners. The defensive armament used by said gunners was not inconsiderable, though it would chop and change a lot throughout the aircraft's development. Initially, there was a 20mm Shivak cannon mounted in a nose turret, commanding a 120 degree cone of fire. There were 7.62mm Shikas machine guns mounted in dorsal and ventral positions. The tail was equipped with another 20mm Shivak cannon, and if that wasn't quite enough, there were also two more 20mm cannons mounted in the rear of the two inner engine nacelles. These could either be accessed internally through a small passage in the wing, or externally through a hatchway on the upper surface, though the idea of using the latter during flight was probably considered a last resort, if that. Carrying a multi-ton bomb load, plus all of the modern equipment required, and enough automatic cannon to classify the bomber as a flying tank, presented a challenge when it came to high altitude performance. There had been a lack of development in the USSR when it came to turbocharging or supercharging aero engines, and as time was pressing, and as Tupolev preferred to not test the patience of his chiefs, the decision was made to install a fifth engine in the fuselage that would drive a giant supercharger. Housed in a fireproof compartment aft of the engineer station, this engine, using a step-up gearbox, drove a centrifugal blower at an astonishing 25,000 RPM, and this drove compressed air through aluminium pipes to the four main propulsion engines. These four engines were the 950 horsepower Mikulin M34FRN, one of the most successful Soviet engines of the 1930s. But due to the unique shape of the upper fuselage, the supercharging engine was the smaller 750 horsepower Klimov M100. This was not ideal, as it meant that two different supplies of engine parts would be needed for maintenance and repairs, but there wasn't really any alternative. The M100 was too weak to be considered for the four propulsion engines, and redesigning the fuselage to accommodate the M34 engine was out of the question. As it turned out, this would be the least of the ANT-42's problems, as design and construction of the prototype got underway, for a myriad of things immediately went wrong. 
Firstly, a different aircraft, the gigantic ANT-20, known more commonly as the Maxim Gorky, was lost in a demonstration flight over Moscow on the 18th of May 1935. As it had been a brilliant demonstration of the capabilities of the Soviet aircraft industry, a flying propaganda tool of the highest calibre, a replacement was immediately demanded, which took up a lot of Tupolev's time and resources. Secondly, the Lenin Steelworks was failing to supply the high-grade steel needed to keep the ANT-42's wings suitably attached to its fuselage. Thirdly, the VVS kept sticking its nose in and making numerous alterations to the specifications that dictated the bomber's design. And finally, there were numerous delays in the production of the M34 engines, which were somewhat needed if the ANT-42 wanted to be anything other than a glorified full-scale model, or perhaps the world's heaviest glider. In fact, when the prototype was rolled out of the factory on November the 9th, 1936, it was still without any of its engines, and they would not arrive for another five weeks. Finally, on the 27th of December, the aircraft completed its first flight. However, the M100 engine for the supercharger had not yet arrived, and so this flight was done with a considerable power deficit. Despite this, the chief test pilot, Mikhail Gromov, reviewed the prototype favourably, praising its stability and responsive ailerons. After 14 test flights, his only major complaints came from the rudder, which he felt was not suitably effective at slower speeds, and the installation of the engines, which presented overheating problems. Both problems were solved within a few months. The rudder was redesigned with a slightly greater area, with the corrugated skin giving way to a stressed metal skin, it was reinstalled on more deeply recessed hinges, and its trim tabs were completely changed. The engines required a more radical change, as evidenced by various wind tunnel tests. The eventual solution to the cooling problem was to place all four radiators in deep ducts under the inner pair of engines. Airflow was controlled by curved inlet doors that hinged on a vertical axis and opened like a clamshell. Not only did this improve cooling dramatically, but it also allowed airflow to be redirected if an engine were lost, or if one engine in particular was having cooling difficulties. In this new guise, and with a working supercharger at last, flight testing of the prototype resumed in July. But by this point, construction on the second prototype was well underway, which incorporated much of the lessons learned with the first. This new aircraft was powered by uprated engines, each producing 1200 horsepower, and the engine driving the supercharger was also beefed up from 750 to 850 horsepower. As its high altitude performance was now expected to be better than ever, the defensive armament was scaled down. All but one of the 20mm Shivak cannons were removed, being replaced by either single or twin mounted machine guns. Along with this change, numerous others were found all across the design. The fuselage was 100mm wider, an improved AP-42 autopilot system was installed, the already huge one6 meter diameter main wheels were further enlarged, the electrical system was revised to be less spark-inducing, more armour was installed, fuel capacity was increased by 2,000-ish litres, and the bomb-carrying provision for the various racks were further improved. This last improvement is what makes the bomber quite famous in certain aviation circles. It could now carry either 40 Fab 100 bombs, 12 Fab 250s, 6 Fab 500s, 4 Fab 1000s, or 1 Fab 2000. And later, during the Second World War, it would carry the massive Fab 5000. This bomb was the largest used by the Soviet Air Forces during the Second World War, and it would not be exceeded until the development of the Fab 9000 demolition bomb during the Cold War. Sadly, few photos of the aircraft carrying this bomb into action seem to exist today, but thankfully I can recreate such a scenario thanks to the sponsor of today's video, War Thunder. War Thunder is a free-to-play military vehicle combat game, with over 2,000 tanks, planes, helicopters and ships to choose from, the PE-8 being among them. 
Each vehicle is incredibly detailed and modelled down to their individual components, offering a highly immersive combat experience where you don't need to worry about bashing down a health bar. This vast collection of vehicles spans over a century of development, running from the 1920s through to the modern day. It features both iconic vehicles from some of the major conflicts of the 20th century, as well as unique one-off prototypes. Using these vehicles you get to take part in intense PvP battles, with different game modes to suit various playstyles. Thanks to these different modes, the game has a very easy learning curve for those who are new to this type of game, and War Thunder has been designed to be as easily accessible as possible. You don't need a supercomputer to run the game, nor any fancy peripherals, and the game is fully cross-platform between PC, Xbox Series XS, PS5 and the previous console generation. All you need is a mouse and keyboard, or a gamepad, to get started. That being said, if you do have a beefy computer, and fancy toys like a HOTAS control, War Thunder can offer amazing 4K gameplay, or, if you're adventurous, some truly enjoyable virtual reality flying, which is my personal favourite. So to try out War Thunder today, and enjoy the hilarity of dropping a 5 ton bomb on your friends or enemies, click on the link in the description below to sign up for free, and in doing so you'll get a free premium tank, aircraft and ship, and you'll get a 7 day account boost along with some other goodies as well. And of course, you'll be supporting this channel. Once again, thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring today's video, and now let's get back to the troubled development of the PE-8. The improvements developed with the second prototype should have launched it into a long and successful production run, but before this aircraft had even flown, the entire bomber program encountered a major problem, one that would cause untold damage to Soviet military enterprises, the Great Purge. Both Tupolev and Petlyakov, the driving forces behind the whole project, were arrested in 1937. This was then further compounded by the arrest and execution of thousands of army and air force officers, along with key members of the aviation industry. One of those arrested was the director of the VM Frunz engine factory, where the AM434 engines for the ANT-42 were being produced, and to make matters worse, the director was arrested before the newest versions of the engine had been cleared for production. Though the bomber was officially accepted for service as the TB-7 in April of 1938, the chaos caused by the arrest of countless key individuals meant that the second prototype did not fly for another three months. Additionally, the factory that was meant to produce the TB-7, Gaz-124, couldn't even start production of the bomber as, one, the factory itself had almost no resources, two, half the production engineers were still incarcerated, or dead, and three, the engine supply situation was becoming so complicated that it was almost comical. The end result was a highly chaotic beginning to the bomber's career. The first production model flew for the first time in late 1939, taking off on skis which promptly broke when it came in for landing. After this, it was discovered that the huge main wheels were safe enough for use on ice, and the aircraft became one of the few Soviet aircraft to ditch skis for winter use altogether. Then, only a few months later at the end of the year, after only a handful of airframes had been built, production was halted as the factory was told that production of the M34 engine had been completely terminated. Not only was the bomber now without its main engine, but the smaller engine that drove the supersized supercharger was also incredibly difficult to source. Because of this, the decision was made somewhere in the upper echelons of the design team to drop the fifth engine and supercharger altogether. This meant that the TB7 had to undergo a rapid and major design change at the 11th hour, which of course brought even more complications. As the team tried to rapidly evaluate potential replacements for the M34 engine, no doubt privately weeping as they did so, the TB7's airframe was redesigned. The gondola-style chin under the nose was deleted, crew complement was increased to 11 with the addition of a commander station in place of the internal engine, a retractable dorsal turret was installed with a 20mm cannon, tandem radio masts were fitted, and the navigation and communication equipment was updated. All of this came at no major cost to performance, thanks to the removal of the internal engine and supercharging pipes, so you were basically trading one weight for another, 
but the question of the main engines was still a cause for concern. A potential solution was explored with the use of diesel engines. In May 1940, Commissar Kaganovich was appointed to the project to replace I.F. Nezval, who in turn had previously replaced Petlyakov after his incarceration. Kaganovich wanted to reinstate production of the bomber using the Cherumsky M30 or M40 diesel engines, which were large water-cooled V12s. Equipped with four turbochargers, the M30 was rated at 1400 horsepower, the M40 at 1500, and it was found that little changes were required to install the engines into the TB7, so it all looked rather promising. Altogether, five aircraft would be built with the M40 engines, and 11 more with the M30s. Due to the efficiency of diesel engines, their range was significantly increased, reaching almost 5,500 kilometers, but most other aspects of the aircraft's performance were negatively affected. Reliability was poor, power and general behaviour were described as unacceptable at high altitudes, take that as you will, starting the engines was often difficult, especially in winter, and its oil consumption was enormous. Though Cheromsky would eventually solve most of the engine's difficulties, the outbreak of war with Germany led to the surviving bombers having their diesel engines swapped out for the Mikulin M35A by the end of 1941. Producing 1350 horsepower, this was the dominant engine that powered the bomber during its early wartime service. However, for a time, both petrol and diesel powered bombers would see some action. Due to the litany of problems that dogged its development and early production run, only one squadron, the second of the 14th Heavy Bomber Regiment, was equipped with TB 7s when Operation Barbarossa began and even then, they were not deemed combat ready due to a lack of aircraft. This was then further hampered by the loss of two aircraft on the ground, and the rest were promptly pulled back. They were then reorganised as part of the new long-range aviation branch of the VVS. Due to the small number of TB7s available, they were not expected to bring decisive results, but the ability to strike right into the heart of German territory was a morale-boosting advantage that could not be ignored. Unfortunately, these particular aircraft were the ones powered by the M30 and M40 diesel engines, and their unreliability was more dangerous than the enemy. Eight took off from Leningrad for a strike on the 1st of October 1941. Only four reached Berlin, their intended target, and just two of them managed to return safely to base. Of the six casualties, one crashed on takeoff due to an engine failure, at least three more had engine failures during the flight, and one had the deep misfortune to be attacked by friendly fighters, then enemy flak, and then suffered an engine failure as well. Following a hasty switch to the more reliable M35 engines, the aircraft's luck improved when it came to attrition, but its slow production at the factory hampered its wartime effectiveness. By the start of October 1941, only 14 aircraft were ready for frontline operations, and although the bombing regiment had received a further 17 by the spring of 1942, their total number had only grown by one, for 16 had been lost during that period. 1942 would not only see a change of fortune, but also a change of title for the bomber as well. Vladimir Petlyakov, who had been responsible for many of the positive design changes that improved the TB7, was killed in a plane crash in January of 1942. Though he was no longer on the project, the bomber was renamed as the PE-8 in his honour later that year. In general, 1942 would be a much more successful year for the PE-8 despite its small production run. Bombers of the 746th and the newly formed 890th Long Range Aviation Regiments would conduct various strikes on German targets throughout the year. Unlike the heavy bombers of the British and American Air Forces, who would arrive in huge numbers in the latter half of the war, the PE-8s were used differently. Rather than broad raids on industrial centres, they were used in so-called pinpoint strikes against airfields, supply lines and transportation hubs deep within enemy territory, often doing so at night and dropping the heaviest bombs possible to make up for any lack of accuracy. 
For the most part, this would consist of the Fab 1000 or 2000 bombs, but later, in 1943, the 5-tonne Fab 5000 was added to the arsenal as well, being dropped for the first time during a raid over Königsberg. The effectiveness of the PE-8s in these strikes is difficult to tell, mostly due to a lack of documentation from either side of the conflict. For the most part, as mentioned earlier, these missions were mostly conducted to boost morale. Additionally, Soviet strategic bombing really wasn't much of a thing during the Second World War, as most of its aviation industry was geared towards close air support in the massive ground battles. But these sporadic attacks, which eventually resulted in a few thousand tons being dropped on German targets, not bad at all seeing as less than 100 PE-8s were ever built, were at least a good demonstration of the aircraft's long-range endurance, when the engines weren't failing. This range was also demonstrated by a series of long-distance flights, specifically those intended to get the Soviet Foreign Minister, Molotov, from Moscow to London, and then on to New York, where discussions would be had about opening a second front in Western Europe. Before these flights had taken place, the PE-8 had been almost unknown to Western observers, and when it arrived in Scotland for the first leg of its journey, it surprised many members of the Royal Air Force. It had been known that the Soviets had fairly modern twin-engine aircraft at their disposal, but many had assumed that their new heavy bomber was more of a continuation from the box-like TB-3. After Molotov had conducted his various visits to US and British leaders, the bomber program was running into yet another engine problem. The excellent M35 was now in short supply. This time, it was decided to try fitting a radial engine to the aircraft instead. For this, the 14-cylinder Shvestov ASH-82 was selected, the same engine that would power the famous Slavochkin series of fighters. The first radial engine PE-8 flew in the autumn of 1942, and it was deemed to be immediately successful, with 34 aircraft eventually being built. Along with the change in power plant, a few other modifications were made to this later model. The nose turret was replaced by a hand-aimed machine gun in a flexible mount. This enabled the tip of the nose to be narrowed, reducing weight and drag at the same time. This, combined with a small increase in overall fuel tankage, resulted in this version of the PE-8 having a range that actually exceeded that of the ones that had been powered by diesel engines. Speaking of which... Chermsky, embarrassed by the failure of their earlier attempts, had developed the far more reliable ACH-30 engine, and this was to go into the final four PE-8s that were to be built. These aircraft were delivered in 1944, but they were not intended to be bombers. Instead, they were built as long-range VIP transports, instantly identified by the addition of a curved dorsal fin. By this point, the loss rate of PE-8s in frontline operations were becoming unsustainable, and with the introduction of Lend-Lease American bombers, the aircraft was gradually removed from frontline service. Records do show that the PE-8 remained with active units until the end of the war, but it's not fully known if they were used for anything major after the end of 1944. After the war, the PE-8 saw over a decade of very varied use. Some bombers were converted over to a similar specification to that of the VIP transports, except they kept their original engines and didn't convert over to the diesels. Some of these, now carrying 12 to 14 passengers, flew on various transport routes for Aeroflot, but some were used for polar exploration. Early polar aircraft had the original radial engines, were painted orange, and had special radio and navigational equipment installed. Later on, they were upgraded to the 1900 horsepower 82 fn version of the engine, driving four-blade propellers, and one single example, operated between 1949 and 1957, was equipped with even more powerful engines, eventually receiving 2600 horsepower ASH-73s, and this aircraft was used to carry a Mi-1 helicopter slung under its belly to a remote polar station. Along with exploring the frigid polar regions, several PE-8s would also serve out the early years of the Cold War as test beds for up to nine different types of engines, with them being mounted on the wings, in the nose, or even under the fuselage. 
One PE-8 was used as a carrier for the experimental Biznovat high-speed air-launched research aircraft, and others were used, after heavy modifications, to test the 10KH, 14KH, and 16KH air-to-surface cruise missiles, which were based on the captured German V-1 flying bombs. Ultimately, the PE-8's post-war life could be considered more successful than its wartime service, especially when its effectiveness is considered against other aircraft of its class. That being said, when the PE-8 made its first public appearance to the Allies, when it landed in Scotland on a brisk spring day, it still surprised those who saw it. This was mostly due to the numerous reports, often provided by various intelligence agents, that the Soviets did not have the infrastructure or resources on hand to produce something like the PE-8 en masse. Technically, they were right. By the time that production of the PE-8 had ceased, only 93 examples had been built. Some sources claim 149, but I wasn't able to find enough evidence to support this. Either way, this was not much at all when compared to the 7,377 Lancasters, 12,731 B-17s, and 18,188 B-24s built by Britain and the United States. But even if the biggest problems that had hampered the PE-8's development, political turmoil and a lack of parts supply, had not occurred, it's unlikely that its production run would have been anywhere near as large as those of its Western rivals. In the lead-up to the war, it had not been clear who the eventual enemy would ultimately be. Would the Soviet Union be facing off against a united Western bloc, or just the Axis powers, or maybe just the democratic powers? This, on its own, would influence the path taken with bomber design, but the size and potential speed of a war front was another matter as well. Britain and the United States had the advantage of a sea barrier, whereas Germany and the Soviet Union did not. This naturally influenced aircraft design to have more of an emphasis on supporting ground battles, rather than pummeling far-flung enemy cities. Of course, the ideal solution would involve bombers that could do both, but for various reasons that are outside the scope of this video, the focus was given to lighter bombers instead. In the end, the PE-8 could not be described as a glowing success. In fact, its history reads somewhat like the plot to some sort of black comedy. It was dogged by development problems, delayed by the paranoid machinations of Soviet leadership, and produced in numbers so small that its effectiveness was doomed from the start. But when looked at individually, especially with the later models, the PE-8 represented a functional, long-range heavy bomber, and one that probably would have done itself credit had Soviet air doctrine preferred the heavy bomber, and had it been produced in large enough numbers. The PE-8's failure as a heavy bomber contrasts sharply with the success of another of Petlyakov's designs, the twin-engine PE-2, which was perhaps the most important and successful Soviet bomber that was built during the Second World War. But the story of the PE-2 is one for another day. Once again, thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring today's video. Don't forget to click on the link below to sign up for free and claim your premium benefits. And who knows, maybe you'll see me flying about dropping five-ton bombs from a horribly mismanaged Soviet heavyweight. As always, thank you all so much for watching. And a big thank you, of course, to the patrons. Now, you would have seen some uh, 3D stuff in this video. There would have been more, but hardware problems stopped me from getting roughly the 10 minutes of 3D stuff that I wanted, and I had to get this video done by the end of the month, so I was kind of under the pump. But hopefully, it'll feature a bit more in upcoming videos, especially on aircraft where there aren't a lot of photos and I now have detailed models for, so look forward to that. A big thank you, of course, to our Wing Commander tier patrons, our highest tier members, and a warm welcome to Sebastian Maynard, who is the newest member of our special group. Voting is underway for next month's special topics for the officer tier members, so don't forget to hop onto Patreon and submit your vote before the time runs out. But as always, thank you all so much for your continued support, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.